It's Friday, November 15th, and this is the Daily Medical News by MD Edge, where we bring you the top medical headlines, plus a closer look at the day's biggest story. I'm Nick Andrews. And I'm Mary Ellen Schneider. Today, an FDA panel gives a thumbs down to an empagliflozin indication for type 1 diabetes. Drug spending is driving up Medicare Part B premiums in 2020. The American College of Physicians offers new solutions to rising drug prices. And methotrexate eases joint erosions but not pain in erosive hand osteoarthritis. Plus, atrial fibrillation ablation may put the brakes on the progression to persistent arrhythmia. But first, thanks to all of you who've helped us make this podcast better by taking our short listener survey. If you haven't, please take a moment to complete the survey by following the link in the show notes. And now, the news. Well, an FDA advisory panel voted against recommending approval of empagliflozin for type 1 diabetes. The drug is already approved for patients with type 2 diabetes. Under the supplemental new drug application, empagliflozin would be used as an adjunct to insulin therapy to improve glycemic control in adults with type 1 diabetes. Members of the FDA's Endocrinologic and Metabolic Drugs Advisory Committee weren't convinced. In a 14-2 vote against the indication, panelists cited persisting concerns about the risk of diabetic ketoacidosis seen with the drug. Patients with type 1 diabetes are at increased risk for DKA. The panel also pointed to the limited pool of evidence presented to support the indication. The agency said it typically receives two major studies to support applications for drug approvals, but the empagliflozin application rests largely on a single phase 3 trial. The FDA is not required to accept its advisory panels' recommendations, but it often does. Medicare Part B beneficiaries paying the standard premium will see their monthly bill rise nearly 7% next year to $144. Deductibles are also going up next year to $198. That's a 7% rise. CMS blames the hikes on rising spending for physician-administered drugs. Those costs ripple out and push Part B premiums and deductibles higher. CMS and Congress are looking at several options to help contain the spending on drugs. Those options include the use of an international pricing index to put U.S. spending more in line with the lower prices offered in foreign countries. Regulators and lawmakers are also considering automatic rebates when drug prices rise faster than the rate of inflation. Promoting the use of lower-cost generics and introducing annual out-of-pocket spending caps are just two of the ideas rolled out by the American College of Physicians to help tame the rising price of drugs. The ACP outlined its price prescriptions in two position papers published in the Annals of Internal Medicine. The ACP's first recommendation is to modify the Medicare Part D low-income subsidy program to encourage the use of lower-cost generic or biosimilar drugs. CMS has estimated that Medicare could have passed on $3 billion in savings to the Part D program and its beneficiaries if available equivalent generics were prescribed instead of brand name drugs. The ACP's second recommendation calls for annual out-of-pocket spending caps for Medicare Part D beneficiaries who reach the catastrophic phase of coverage. During 2007 to 2015, the number of seniors who reached that catastrophic coverage limit doubled to more than 1 million. The ACP also supports repeal of the law that prevents Medicare from negotiating directly with pharmaceutical manufacturers over the price of drugs. For a complete look at the ACP's proposals, click the link in the podcast notes. The Daily Medical News will be right back after this.
Methotrexate didn't top placebo at reducing pain in patients with symptomatic erosive osteoarthritis of the hand, but it may have a role in reducing joint damage and increasing bone remodeling. Those are the key findings from the randomized controlled ADAM trial. Researchers from Cote d'Azur University in Nice, France, presented the findings at the annual meeting of the American College of Rheumatology. 64 patients with symptomatic erosive hand osteoarthritis were randomized to 10 milligrams of methotrexate per week, or placebo. At 12 months, improvements in hand pain scores were similar in methotrexate and placebo patients, roughly a 25% improvement in both groups. Joint degradation wasn't significantly higher in the placebo group than in the methotrexate group. But at 12 months, the methotrexate patients saw a significantly greater number of erosive joints progressing to a remodeling phase compared with the placebo group. And finally today, radiofrequency catheter ablation of AFib is not just a more definitive rhythm control treatment than antiarrhythmic drugs. It's also much more effective at slowing AFib's progression from proxismal to persistent. In the ATTEST study, ablation cut the incidence of progression to persistent AFib by 89% compared with medically managed patients. It's a statistically significant difference that documents an unappreciated benefit of catheter ablation, the ability to slow AFib progression. A test enrolled older patients with proxismal AFib who had not fully responded to one or two rhythm or rate control drugs. The trial's 255 patients were randomly assigned to radiofrequency catheter ablation or medical management. They were then followed for three years. After one year, 1% of the ablation patients developed persistent AFib compared with 7% of the patients assigned to drug management. After three years, the respective rates of progression were 2% and 18% respectively. The rate of serious adverse events was low, occurring in 12% of ablated patients and 5% of controls. Dr. Carl Heinz Kuck of the Asclepios Clinic St. George in Hamburg, Germany, presented the findings at the annual Congress of the European Society of Cardiology. He says assessing progression to persistent AFib is a new endpoint for ablation, and it's an important one because that progression has been linked with increased mortality, strokes, and hospitalizations. If the findings are confirmed, Dr. Cuck says, they could lead to a new indication for catheter ablations in patients with proxismal AFib. And that's it for today's daily medical news. Be sure to catch the newest episodes of CardioCast and the Post Call Podcast. New episodes of CardioCast and Post Call drop each and every Friday. For MD Edge, I'm Nick Andrews. Our stories this week were contributed by Therese Borden, Andrew Bowser, Doug Brunk, Steve Samino, Jeff Craven, Richard Frankie, Alicia Gallegos, Amy Karen, Bianca Nograde, Kari Oaks, Alex Otto, Will Pass, Jenny Smith, Michelle Sullivan, Greg Trockman, Carrie Dooley Young, and Mitchell Zoller. Our editors include Terry Rudd, Kathy Scarbeck, Denise Fulton, Therese Borden, Katie Lennon, Glenn Williams, Richard Peasy, Laura Nicolaitis, Catherine Nellist, Jeff Evans, Elizabeth Metchkati, Laura McGlade, Mark Lesney, Gina Henderson, and Catherine Hackett. And I'm Mary Ellen Schneider. If you like what you hear on the Daily Medical News, please leave us a review or rating on Apple Podcasts. And check out the full stories available via the links in the podcast notes. Have a great weekend, and we'll see you next week.